Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? I know if you're like me, you come in, you sit down. What I like to do before our worship is just go, praise the Lord, we made another week, amen? We are gathered together as the body of Christ here together. And God has been good to us this week. How do I know that? Because we can go, amen, we can be grateful for that. I've been thinking about the um, fighter verses leading up to this week's, throughout this week, and just listen to these. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forevermore. And then we saw in Romans 8, 28 through 30, and we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called, all past tense, listen to this, those whom he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Think about that. When you said yes to Jesus, eternity was sealed. If you take that verse seriously, even before you said yes to Jesus, your eternity was sealed. That's what it means to be glorified. That's what it means to be predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Romans 8, 31 through 32 says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the one that we looked at last week, Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Simply, church, what that means, if God says it, it's true, and it will happen. And that is the faithful God we are here to worship this morning. If God has said it from eternity past, guess what? It will happen. If God has said it, it will occur. He doesn't lie, and he does not make promises he cannot keep. We are loved by a father who is not fickle or frail. He is faithful. Now, this is good news. Because God hasn't changed his mind about you. Think about that. You know what you did last week. You know that self-righteous attitude you had with that family member or person. You know that thing that you looked at that you knew you shouldn't have looked at. You know that mindset, that hard-heartedness, that bitterness that you have towards somebody else. That you know about, that the only other being that knows is God himself knows and the reality is in spite of our willful rebellion against him he doesn't change his mind toward us in Christ Jesus that excites my heart to worship when we breathe it's proof that God is keeping us that God loves us that God is faithful toward, toward us and so we come this morning to worship without any fear of rejection we come this morning to worship because we worship a God who is faithful to, toward us in spite of our rebellion against him. So if you're like me, you know what, what makes me want to do this morning is sing. <laughs> makes me want to sing to my Savior who died 
and has risen again victorious King Jesus who came not to be served but to serve and to be the ransom for many for us so that we could be made right and be invited to the family of God. So church, I just want to invite you this morning to stand up. And we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to inhabit our praises this morning. And while I'm praying, I'm just going to take a moment just to be quiet. And when I'm quiet, what I want you to do is I want you to just, is there anything this week that I just need to give over to the Lord? Is there anything, any worry, any stress, any sin, any sin you meant to do or sin you didn't mean to do? So just close your eyes right now. Is there anything you just need to give it over and say, Lord, I blew it. Is there anything you need to be thankful or grateful for this morning? Just call out to him and say, Lord, thank you. Father, we thank you for Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Who is the one through whom you have began a good work in us and you are faithful to complete that good work. That in eternity past, in Christ, you have chosen and will glorify. And that's based on your faithfulness toward us, not our faithfulness toward you. God, that's why it's grace. And that is grace that is freely given. And that is grace that is given in spite of our sin. And so there's only one name we can worship this morning. It's not my name or Blake's name or even Calvary, the church name. The only name we can worship this morning is Jesus. Because he is the only reason we are accepted into your family as your children. He is the reason why you are faithful toward us and you will not give up on us because the one who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God the king has come he has laid down his life he has rose again victorious over death and the grave and so now we worship that king this morning thank you for giving us Christ now may the praises of your people be heard May our prayers be a fragrance that's pleasing to you. May your spirit fill this room. May we hear from you today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
can uh, keep standing, just reach down, grab your, grab your Bible, and turn to Psalm 46. Uh, Pastor Blake is going to come and bring us the word this morning. Psalm 46. Just want to take this moment to welcome all of those who are watching online. Um, that's normally my job every Sunday is to be up there clicking the right button, turning the cameras around, doing all those things to make sure that those people who can't be with us are still able to worship with us. And so um, I am grateful for everyone who is joining us online. And um, God has used that ministry in an amazing way to keep people connected to Calvary Baptist Church. And so um, we just praise the Lord for that. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. I remember what Pastor Brandon has said before. If it's possible to be shaken, it will be shaken. And we've seen over the past 14 months a lot of shaking. Thank you for your word that reminds us that you are the unshakable God of Jacob. Now as Pastor Blake comes and, and gives us the word, as he opens up this passage of scripture i pray that you would give us eyes to ear uh, eyes to see <laughs> excuse me ears to hear god that we would see christ clearly that we would hear from your word that your spirit would speak boldly into our hearts and we would be reminded of truly how great is our god thank you for all that you've done for us in christ jesus thank you for your word now bless the preaching of it in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. All right. It's an honor to bring the word in Pastor Brandon's absence. He's traveling this week. He's going to be out of town with Abel. So we'll be praying for them that they have a, a great time away. Um, I don't know if you guys are like me or have done what I did this past week. It might say a lot about me that maybe you don't appreciate. This is the first week this spring I've cut my grass so far. And uh, I don't know where you are if you've been doing it for a couple of months. This past Monday was the first time I cut my grass, so and it already looks horrible again. But uh, as I was cutting, so we have a gazebo in our backyard, and we have um, like garden rocks around it. You guys know what I'm talking about. And so I was driving around, listening to an audio book, not really paying attention to a whole lot. You don't have to. That's one reason I like cutting the grass. You can kind of turn your brain off and and just coast. But I turned around the back of our gazebo. And all of a sudden, was a little bit startled by what I saw on the ground. I, I saw this bird, and it come to find out it was a mama bird, completely, like, statued, bowed up like she was going to take on a, a John Deere lawnmower, not moving. And it actually, it did kind of startle me a little bit, and I thought, maybe, is this a statue? Like, what's going on here? Somebody tricking us? And as you can uh, probably infer what was going on, as I got a little bit closer to see, this was a mama bird, and what she was doing was she was protecting her four eggs 
from the massive John Deere lawnmower that she was going to take out if I got any closer to her eggs. And then I found out upon further inspection that the reason that this bird had laid a nest in the rocks instead of in the top of our gazebo like they normally do, which is somewhat frustrating, um, that her wing was broken or something was going on. She couldn't fly because I saw a rabbit get after her and she, she wouldn't take off. And uh, it was just a really interesting, I'm not real good with illustrations, and you might continue to say that after, even after this illustration, but it was pretty I was praying all week, God, please, or even before this past week, God, please show me what you have for your people in your word. One of the most difficult assignments for pastors is when uh, you finish preaching through an entire book and you know where you're going to be every Sunday for a year or so, and then all of a sudden you're done with it and you have to decide what you're going to preach on. And so I told Pastor Brandon, it took me twice as long to decide what I was going to preach on as it did to prepare when, after I decided to preach. And, uh, but I just want to read to you, our text is going to be Psalm 46, but I just want to read to you in light of what I just shared with you from Psalm 91 to prepare our hearts a little bit for uh, what I feel like the Lord is, has for us today. Psalm 91, 1 through 4. You can follow along or you can just listen. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. So again, I've just been really asking the Lord, what do you have for us today? God's word is always timely. God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So all of God's word is helpful, but just really praying, God, what do you have for us? And I know our church family's been through a lot this last year as, as an, kind of an understatement. I know that there's been a lot of disease, a lot of death, a lot of disappointment, and I think sometimes we can minimize the hurt that's present in our own lives. Um, we live in a church culture, unfortunately, that regularly says things like, uh, just leave your burdens at the door right? You just, you just put a smile on. You don't have to raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. But how many of you guys felt like that this morning? Maybe you've had a tough week and you felt like, well, I got to kind of put on the mask before I go to church today so everybody thinks all is well. These types of sayings, they're well-meaning, but they really neglect the difficulties that we experience in our life and that we all go through and maybe you're cu currently going through. Um, we'd say, don't leave your burdens at the door, <laughs> right? Don't leave your burdens at the door. You don't have to put a smile on. You can, and you should, and you must bring your burdens to the only one who can help you. And so this put a smile on attitude, it is well-meaning, but misguided. God tells us in his word that he is here for us. He tells us that in his word that he is the only one who can take your burdens, after all, we know God became a man in Christ Jesus, the perfect, sinless, matchless, glorious Son of God, took on flesh, walked among sinful, imperfect people, and He is the only one who has ever lived who was not guilty of sin, and He is also the one who bore the sins of many on the tree, as we just celebrated uh, last week, and then was raised gloriously back to life on the third day. He came to His own people to save them, and they murdered Him. Jesus suffered disappointment. See if you can identify with this. He suffered disappointment. He suffered betrayal. He suffered denial, and ultimately suffered death. And we can say without a shadow of a doubt, there might not be anybody else in this room who can understand your suffering, but Jesus can, for sure. Listen to this, Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The only one who can actually understand what you're going through is Jesus. This is why the writer of Hebrews says that we can draw near to the throne of grace. Knowing the one who sits on the throne understands and he sympathizes with us. 
One of the things that I get to do every day, which I love more than anything, and I'm waiting as Hallie gets older that I can spend time and we can all read together. But one thing that Sam and I do every night is we read, uh, we read through a book together and then we read through his, we're reading through his Bible, right? And we're reading through a portion of John right now. And if you remember in John 6, where the disciples are in the boat, and then all of a sudden this huge storm comes up, and they just immediately get afraid. And all of a sudden, do you remember what they see? They see somebody walking towards them on the water. And I just find it astonishing and very helpful in my own life that Jesus does not say, I'm going to calm this storm, don't be afraid. You know what he does say? It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus doesn't stand off at a distance. He comes to us in the midst of the storm. And a question that I've been wrestling with for, I feel like, time and time again is, is, is would I rather be safely on the shore without Jesus or in the midst of the storm with him? I think that's a good question to ask sometimes that we need to be reminded of. He doesn't stand at a distance. He is with us in our sufferings as one who has suffered. So Pastor William just read from Psalm 46. That's going to be our passage for today. And I want us to spend some time considering these verses. So this psalm was probably, if you were listening, written in a time of tremendous crisis. The sons of Korah were the ones who wrote this psalm, which makes the fact that it was written under some type of tremendous crisis, it makes the confession of faith even more powerful. But the crisis is left unidentified. We're not really sure why it was written, like what, were, what was the situation and circumstance. So we can and should understand that the truths contained in this psalm, we should understand them to go far beyond any local situation. In other words, we can say it too, right? This psalm contains fundamental truth that is so easy for us to forget. How many of y'all, um, I heard somebody this week, there's a podcast I listened to, and there was a guy who was a former special forces in the military, and he said, you know, you often hear... Um, you will rise to the occasion when a bad situation presents itself, you'll rise to the occasion. And he said, that's a lie. You will not rise to the occasion. You will default to your highest level of training. And I thought, that's a lot of truth in that for the Christian life. If you think when suffering and trials come that you're just going to immediately, uh, immediate sanctification, oh, well, all of a sudden you're going to be more like Jesus, we'd say, that's not going to happen, right? We need to train and prepare ourselves to be reminded of the truths in this, and how many of you also know that we can have the best of intentions for when the bad times come, that we will stand fast and we will cling to Christ, but you know as well as I do, often when the bad times come, that's when we actually retreat, and we don't do the things that we had planned to do. We need to plan and prepare for suffering, because in this world, you will have trouble, but what does he say next? But take heart, I've overcome the world. So we're going to look at Psalm 46 just for a few minutes. And you're going to think these points are incredibly simplistic it's because they are. Number one, the first thing I want us to consider is so basic, it's easily overlooked, is this. God is our refuge and strength. How often do we look at somebody else or something else to be our refuge and strength? How easy it for, is it for us to look to that person, to that spouse, to that job, to that whatever for for strength and for refuge, to the hobbies, education, government, military, political figures, legislation, all sorts of things that are all passing away. How many of us know this? They're all passing away. But the psalmist wants you and I to know that God is the one who is our refuge and strength. The reason this is such a powerful truth is because God, unlike everything and everyone else in your life at some point, is not going to leave you or forsake you. He is not going anywhere. Anything besides God in which you seek salvation and refuge will let you down because it is not created to be your salvation and refuge. God is and God alone. St. Augustine, he had this, this idea, I think is incredibly helpful. It's what he called rightly ordered loves. If you go back and you read him, most of what he said is, is incredibly helpful. But I think that this notion of rightly ordered loves can help in this particular situation. This is what he said. This is what he understood, and it's a biblical principle, that if you don't love God ultimately, you can't love anything else appropriately. Does this make sense? If you don't love God ultimately, you cannot love anything else 
Notice I did not say will not. That's a different conversation. You cannot, you do not have the ability to love God or to love anything else appropriately. The reason for this is because we all love something ultimately, right? It might be your own self or it might be your children or it might be your wife or your husband or your job. Whatever, you know, the list goes on. But if that thing or person is not God, not only do we lose God, we lose that thing or person. Here's why. Because we put them in a position that they were not created to fulfill. They cannot do it. If you've got your spouse in the position of Savior and refuge in your life, guess what? You're not going to love your spouse appropriately because you're going to be constantly left down, let down. rather. If you put your children in this place of Savior and refuge where everything else is falling apart, but I can seek refuge and salvation in my children, guess what? You're not going to be able to love them appropriately because you're going to constantly be putting them on a pedestal they cannot live up to. Only God can do this. This is why only when we love God as He deserves, as the one that we put in that position in our lives, will we not be let down. And we can say... We love God because He loves us. We love God as He deserves. And we are able to love everything else as He, she, or it deserves. Because God loves me, not for what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. And I love Him because He first loved me. Now I'm free to give myself and love others without expecting anything in return. The same truth goes for who or what I look to for strength and refuge. If you look for strength and refuge in anything besides God alone, you no longer have a refuge and strength that can stand against any and everything. And you are also putting that person or thing in an impossible Savior seat in which they were never intended to occupy. Never. If you have anything except for God in that place in your life, you will inevitably and habitually be let down and disappointed. The second thing I want us to consider, simply enough, is that God is our refuge and strength. I'm just quoting the verse, right? But that's what we're going to talk about. What does it mean that God is our refuge? What do you think of when you think about a refuge? Normally, what comes to my mind is a particular place, right? Looking for refuge, and maybe maybe that's come to be more of a term of comfort in our day than it is a term of I'm actually in danger and I need to have refuge somewhere. We say, I'm looking for refuge in solace, so I'm just going to go to the beach for a couple of days, right? That's not what, uh, clearly that's not what the psalmist is talking about here. Normally, though, I think we do, and under any circumstances, whether it's for comfort or if we're in real danger, we think of a place. But the psalmist doesn't speak of a place. The psalmist talks about a person. He speaks of God. God is the one to whom we must run for refuge. God, the unchanging, is the one in whom we find shelter. And this understanding is found all over the place in the Scriptures. If you go back and you look, we read all over the place that normally we would find fulfillment in a place, or a, but instead we're given a person. One thing that we would expect to find in a place or a, of, of refuge is rest as well. And here's what I want you to think about. Hebrews 11 and 12. How many of you guys know Hebrews 11? How many of you guys know of all the chapter breaks in the Bible, the chapter break between chapter 11 and 12 of Hebrews might be the most unfortunate? Because unless you, and also, those weren't in the inspired original text, just to make that clear. I'm not saying anything wrong here. They were added way after the fact. And often what we do is we divide our Bible reading up into chapters. How many of you do this? Like you read one chapter a day, or instead of maybe a flow of thought, we read a chapter. And that's fine if you remember what you read today, tomorrow, right? But Here's what I want you to listen. Just listen to this for a minute. We're going to read the part of chapter 11 of Hebrews and then some of chapter 12. Looking forward to the city that has foundations. Listen, we're just talking about a place, finding its fulfillment in a person. Just listen to this. We're talking about the Faith Hall of Fame, right? What we see in Abraham, he says this. Looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We see that those who... All died in faith, not having received the things promised, but have seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Here it is. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. 
If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared them for, for them a city. You see what's happening here? This is what all these, these saints who've gone before us, this great cloud of witnesses, are looking for. A city, a homeland, a better country. And then the chapter ends by saying, And all these, though commended through, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And again, that's where a lot of us would stop in our daily Bible reading. Listen to how chapter 12 begins. That's the end of chapter 11. Listen to how chapter 12 begins. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to who? Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is what Paul says to the church at Corinth. Guess what? All of God's promises find their yes in Christ. All of them. So the writer of Hebrews does, he takes this 11th chapter speaking about a place, and then this place finds its fulfillment, culminates not in a place necessarily, though we do see that continued on through Hebrews 12, but in a person. Look to Jesus. We're looking for the kingdom, and God said, and he read in Hebrews here that Jesus is the one to whom we should look, right? And at the end of chapter 12, the kingdom that is given it cannot be shaken. Do you know why the kingdom can't be shaken? Because the king can't be shaken. We're given a place that is the place it is because of the person who is there. Jesus is our rest and our refuge. So we look to Jesus for refuge. Number three, God is our refuge and strength, as you would have seen that coming. One commentator says that strength refers to God within. To empower the weak for action. Here's a serious question Again, you don't have to raise your hand because we've all been there. Have you ever wondered how you're going to find the strength to go one more day? It's one of those questions that because everybody can say yes to it, we don't talk about it, right? The things that we can all say yes to, we rarely talk about. We talk about things that, you know, you hear, hear people say, the sin that you struggle with is not what you want to talk about. You'd rather talk about the thing that the other person struggles with. Well, we all have had these days where we do not feel like we're going to be able to go on another day. We'd say, same thing Jesus said here, you don't have to pretend, right? We don't have to pretend with each other. The last several months here at Calvary, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and we've heard about confusion. Those who followed Jesus were over and over, frustratingly so almost, though we put ourselves in their shoes and we do the same. They were frustrated, confused, they misunderstood, they had difficult questions, and we see them asked by Jesus' followers, and then we regularly, just as often as we see confusion, misunderstanding, and difficult questions from his followers, we see patience and grace and mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ with those who continue to struggle. And one of our conclusions that we've talked about the last several months is that God can handle your honesty. God can handle your doubt, God can handle your confusion, and God can handle your fear. So this is not a place where you have to pretend to have everything together. I'm sorry if you feel that it is. It's not. It is in pretending that you have everything together that you are prevented from addressing the reality that you don't have everything together. Right? Part of addressing our weakness is admitting that there is a weakness there to begin with. Right? But how many of us are unwilling to admit that problem? We want to put on a, maybe put on a show and say, well, we don't have, this a word that's become kind of a cliche in our day and age is transparency. But you can say a word so often that it really loses its meaning, right? And so we want to say this, we, we don't want to use the, the throwaway word. We want to say, no, you don't have to pretend here. In fact, if you do pretend, the problem's never going to be fixed. God is strong. You and I are weak. God empowers us. And it is God and God alone who is our strength. I'm going to. A lot of scripture today, but I'm going to read this. This is our fighter verse from a couple weeks ago. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. 
The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. We remind of that at the beginning of the service. God is our help. And consider the situation the psalmist is describing. Therefore, we will listen to this. We will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. And some of you feel like this has literally happened to you today. Maybe you have found yourself in a situation where you literally feel like the earth has given away. But this is what the psalmist says next. God is a very present help in trouble. God all powerful, refuge and strength. God all present, very present help in trouble. Your translation might say he's a well-proved help in trouble. In other words, God has always been there to help no matter what has happened or what is happening. He has proved that he is faithful. And I was reminded of an old hymn that we're going to sing here in just a few minutes. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. How many of you know this song? Just listen to some of these words real quick. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, and to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. There's a lot more lyrics. We won't read all of them now because we're going to sing them there in a few minutes. But the reason I wanted to share those is because Jesus is the embodiment of this psalm. Right? Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He came, as Galatians says, in the fullness of time. He came, as Romans says, while we were yet sinners. He laid his life down for us while we were following the prince of the power of the air. He came to us as a very present help in trouble. Now listen to the rest of the psalm. Pastor William read it while I go. I'm going to read it again because you may have forgotten it in the last few minutes. All the things that evoke fear in this life, Jesus destroys. Listen to this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. And know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Meaning, chill and listen. That's my, what I think it means. There are three spheres here that the psalmist talks about in the remainder of the psalm. That God, in sphere after sphere, God is with his people as their strength and refuge. And the Psalmist points out that God is powerful over nature, God is powerful over the attackers of his city, and God is powerful over the whole warring world. If you go back and you look, the breaks in your Bible will show you where those divisions are. And the more I study the Bible and pray for God's help to understand, the more he shows me that every major theme in Scripture can be traced back to the first few pages of the Bible or forward to the, la- to the, to the uh, last few pages of the Bible. And I want you to consider this. This is how we're going to close. Consider how the scriptures end. God is powerful over nature, his city, and the whole warring world. Here's what I want you to do. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 21. So we just saw that God exercises his power over those three things. Nature, city of God, whole earth. But here's what I want to do. I'm trying to figure out if I have time to do this. We'll do it. I don't know when the last time you read these two chapters was. And I know how easy it is to be distracted and to consider something else right now. But I really want you to listen. Again, God is powerful and with us in the midst of nature, the city of God, and the entirety of creation, the earth. Listen to this. 
The heading of my Bible says, the new heaven and the new earth. Chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Somebody say amen. (laughs) Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. If that's not marked or underlined in your Bible, I would encourage you to do that. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the uh, the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me this holy city, Jerusalem. Remember what we were just talking about, the city of God? Coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And on the gates the the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north north three, on the south three, and on the west three. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod. Twelve thousand stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first jasper, then sapphire, then agate, and then emerald, and then onyx, and then carnelian, then chrysolite, and then beryl, and then topaz, and then chrysophase, then jack ink, and then amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the streets of the city was like pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in that city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Almost done. Just hang with me. Just hang with me for a few more minutes. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will give will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And He said to me, these words again are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent His angel to show His servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each for what he has done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates outside of the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and idolatry and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I want everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of, pro- of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. I did that for a reason. Each sphere that we've spoken about from Psalm 46, nature, city of God, whole earth. This is what we learn about those three things. Now God is with us in the midst, right? The Holy Spirit indwells us, and he is with us while we are yet still here. This is where a lot of people get their theology wrong. If you get the already but not yet confused, you will be utterly miserable. There is coming a day where this will be the reality. It's not here yet. Listen to this, the whole earth is reversed, the great reversal motif through the scripture that we read about, Revelation 22. God is with us in the midst of the warring nations. He's with us here. He is our strength and our refuge. But Psalm Psalm 2 even tells us in the Messianic Psalm, though the nations rage and the people's plot in vain, but one day with God, the world itself will give way to a new heavens and a new earth. The whole of heaven and earth will be made new and perfect. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The city of God. Now God is inhabiting by his Holy Spirit his people who are his dwelling place. But nonetheless, we are still in the midst of struggles and trials. Amen? We are. Though God is with us in the midst of them. But one day, with God, Jerusalem becomes the new Jerusalem with the Father and the Son seated on the throne, ruling and reigning in power forever. The kingdoms that totter in Psalm 46 give way to a king whose kingdom shall never be destroyed and a dominion that shall never pass away, as we read in Daniel 7 and Hebrews 12 and many other places. It's not merely that this kingdom, it doesn't say that nothing's going to come against it to try to shake it. It says the very nature of it is such that it cannot be shaken. Finally, nature. The earth does quake, literally. I looked up last night to see how many earthquakes there were this week in California and on the west coast and it would blow your mind there have been so many all over the world the earth as Romans 8 says is groaning with birth pains earthquakes tsunamis there's all kinds of things in this world hurricanes tornadoes wildfires of catastrophic proportions bombs that could actually make mountains go into the heart of the sea Global pandemics, the list goes on. But God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in this trouble. But one day with God, the chaotic seas, as Psalm 98 says, says, let the seas roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing for joy. Guess what? The chaotic sea one day is going give, to give way and will become the life-giving waters that we just read about in the New Jerusalem. And the mountains are going to clap their hands and sing for joy. And in the middle of the street, again, the menacing waters that represent chaos and confusion in the scriptures are done away with. And there we see the river of life and the Lord Jesus saying, come drink without price. And then what comes immediately after we get the glimpse of these things that are to come? Jesus is coming. It's the next thing that John writes. The reality is that God is with us. In the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue to live in times of uncertainty, weakness, and danger, but we are not alone. God is with us, and soon we will be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. And the psalm ends like this. This is where we'll finish. Be still. Simple question. When is the last time you were still? On purpose. And you thought to yourself, God is God. Be still and know that I'm God. 
I will be exalted among the nations, he says. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. This is the writer writing here, and God said that. And this is the writer writing it to close the psalm out. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And there is coming a day where God will be exalted among the nations and in the earth. And the Lord of hosts is with us now. The Lord of the armies of heaven, he is our fortress. Remember the mama bird caring for her eggs, ready to take the world on for her own. Remember that, take heart, dear Christian, for God is our refuge and strength. Amen. Would you stand and we'll pray together. Father, thank you that you are with us. You have never left us. You will never forsake us. You have given us your Holy Spirit to indwell us so that we will be built up into your dwelling place. But in this world, we still do have trouble. Kingdoms totter, nations rage, the earth gives way, the mountains move. But God, there is coming a day where all those things will give way and Jesus will descend and all things will be made new. So God, keep us, hold us fast. Thank you that we have an anchor who is an anchor for our soul. That in the midst of the storm, Jesus is immovable, though we are not. We cling to him. So, Father, I pray as we sing this last song, that uh, you would, by your Holy Spirit, impress on our hearts, those that are here today or watching on the stream, who are struggling, who feel alone. By your Holy Spirit, help us to know that in Christ, we are never alone. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name.
Can be seated just for a moment. Okay. Um, why secret church? Whenever we think of church in America, we most often think of going to meet at a building, singing, praying, hearing a message from a pastor. But in many places around the world, church meets in a home or an apartment, sometimes even in secret. And many times there are just a few believers in that area who know and follow Christ. They face all kinds of challenges and difficulties in meeting together, some places maybe even dangerous. So when they come together, they want to make the most of their time in a way that maybe is different than what you and I are often used to. Yeah. Secret Church is our version of a gathering then where we meet for an intense time of Bible study. Prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing persecution. Secret Church is not for the uncommitted or the faint at heart, but if you want to know God more deeply through His Word and know His church more fully around the world, then Secret Church is designed for you. It's not just to come and learn for one night and kind of have an event, but the goal is to pray together, to study the Word together, and then to use what we've learned during that gathering to make disciples of Jesus more faithfully right where we live and then wherever God may lead us around the world, maybe even to places where it's difficult and dangerous to share the gospel. So part of the reason that we put this at the end of the service is because if you've been to Secret Church before, you know that a huge emphasis, and uh, David Platt just shared this as well, that we pray. Like the night is dedicated to studying the Word and praying. And uh, so I know it's not something that probably everybody's going to come to. It's a long night. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that, but it is a glorious night that you won't forget. Um, this week, or this, this year rather, is, uh, the, the, ti- the title of the Secret Church is called The Great Imbalance. And as you've just seen, there is an imbalance. <laughs> like there is, there's something off about the way the church is. And if you look at our brothers and sisters across the world who are worshiping, uh, and they're worshiping uh, maybe at the cost of their lives or by being cut off from their families. Uh, and here we sit, right? Praise God that we're able to sit here in freedom. And that we're able to gather together and we're not afraid of. But we also, like we said a while ago, we need to prepare for when that day comes here. And also pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing that now. So the night for Secret Church is April 23rd. It's a Friday evening. And it lasts from 6 to whenever we finish. Probably around midnight, maybe a little later. Um, so you're all invited. <laughs> it's going to be an awesome, awesome night of prayer. And so if you can't, if you want to come and you don't, and you can't stay for the whole thing, that's perfectly fine. Um, but what, what I would ask you to do, just so we make sure we have the right materials, is on the welcome center. There's a sign up. If you're going to be here, um, just make sure you sign up so we know who's going to be coming. But you're all invited. It's going to be a great night. Second, and this is the last thing. Uh, if you're interested in going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, really it's Cranberry, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, uh, in August from August 4th through August 9th, which is a Wednesday through Monday, with us on a trip to go help church planners, Will and Aaron Cole at New Horizon Church. If you guys remember, in October, Will was here. He brought the word for us. Awesome guy, great brother in Christ, awesome church. Uh, but we're going to be going there to, to help them with various things, and all that will be laid out in the interest meeting uh, after the second service. So I know you're here at the first service, but if you'd like to stay or if you'd like to talk to me, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, it's just going to be a, kind of the who, what, when, where, why uh, after the second service. So you're all invited to that as well. Um, if you guys would stand and we'll, we'll close in prayer. Thank you for being here today. Father, what a glorious day it's been. Another day, another Lord's Day, another three days after Friday where we get to celebrate, remember that the Lord Jesus on the first day of the week stepped out of the tomb having, as Hebrews 2 says, defeated the one who has the power of death, the devil, and therefore delivering we who were subject to lifelong slavery and fear of death. We've been delivered through Jesus. 
God, I do pray as we head into uh, uh, here just a few weeks for Secret Church, God, I pray that it would be a glorious night of um, studying your word, of hearing your voice, and praying for the nations, and of just getting a glimpse of what our brothers and sisters go through, to come together to, to sit and to be attentive and to hear what you have to say. So God, I pray that, that would be a good night for, for Calvary and for churches all across the world who are going to be participating. I pray that that would be a night that is sanctifying uh, to us, that, that uh, is uh, good for us and glorifying to the Lord Jesus. We also pray for um, Will and Aaron and Samuel and Catherine and Oliver and New Horizon Church there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, God, we pray that you would be with them even now as Pastor Will is either about to, has already done, or is in the middle of preaching the word. God, we pray that you would be with them now and that your word would all over this planet today go forth in power and that we would be able to see what Paul says to the church at Colossian chapter 1 that the gospel has gone into the earth and it is bear serve our brother Will and his church family uh, while we're there we love you pray that you go with us now pray that we would remember that Jesus Christ himself is with us now and in him do we find refuge and strength and he is with us in ever present help and trouble and there's coming a day where he will reign over all the nations. And that reigning and sovereignty and kingship will be realized. And everyone will see him and bow before him. We love you. Thank you for Jesus and pray this in his name. Amen.